thank you for this opportunity to provide an introductory remark on this important panel. Today, surpassing World War II, the number of refugees is the highest in our modern history. I am from Myanmar, a country which, under a brutal military, has been producing refugees for generations. Among the world's 26 million refugees, there are at least 4 million from Myanmar in neighboring countries. Never held accountable, the Myanmar military has been emboldened to stage a coup and continue their campaign of brutality. Just yesterday, the junta intensified its airstrike, forcing an 85-year-old ethnic Karen woman to flee for the third time, now with her 80-year-old granddaughter and hundreds of other civilians. In Myanmar, we have never seen real peace since our independence from British rule. In 2017, due to the collective international failure, my community, the Rohingya, was promoted from being one of the most persecuted group to one of the largest refugee groups on earth. One third of our people had no choice but to flee their home in Myanmar from persecutions, apartheid, and genocide. Justice has yet to be served. Like many refugees, the Rohingya's journey has not been an easy one. After crossing lands and seas for days, they have continued to suffer subhuman living standards. Caged by barbed wires in squalid refugee camps, women in particular are at extreme risks of sexual exploitation and trafficking. Their dignity has been ripped away. Now, amid the country's military coup, Rohingya refugees are stranded on Andaman Sea and at severe risk of being deported from India and Malaysia. Recently, many Karen ethnic, including women and children, have been barred from taking refuge in Thailand for safety and protections. And increasingly, during the COVID-19 pandemic, refugees are facing discriminations, xenophobia, and racism in host countries. Nobody wants to be a refugee. We must remember that refugees are also human beings with feelings, dreams, knowledge, and abilities. If their rights are respected and protected, they can thrive and become strength of our society. Three years ago, I met a 15-year-old girl, Minara, who was forced to flee from home and school in Myanmar. Now, she's teaching children in Khos Bazar refugee camps. Minara reminds me of my seven devastating years without school in Myanmar's prison. It is our responsibility that our future generations, including Minara, have access to protections, educations, employment opportunity, and can pursue their dreams. It is our responsibility to ensure that justice is served for all refugees. We must hold perpetrators accountable for their crimes, including sexual violence and genocide. If we fail to end all impunities, the cycles of violence and refugee exodus will continue. We must do everything to address the root causes of our global refugee crisis. If Minara can take actions as a refugee, you all can do a lot more with your power, privilege and leadership. I am U.S. Senator Chris Coons from Delaware. It's my honor to join you for this conversation uh, between two of the most recognizable and most capable advocates on behalf of refugees. 
Um, first, we're joined by Angelina Jolie, who is not just a talented and widely recognized actress and director, but also has served for many years as special envoy to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. We're also joined by Hamdi Ulukaya, who's the founder and CEO of Chobani Yogurt, uh, someone who grew up uh, enjoying uh, traditional Kurdish yogurt and has brought it uh, to the United States and has now been a forceful advocate um, for the role of the private sector in addressing humanitarian crises and in particular, um, welcoming and including refugees in the United States. Um, thank you both for being a part of this conversation today. Thank you for having us. Let me also thank Cindy McCain, the McCain Institute and everyone who helps make the Sedona Forum happen uh, year in and year out. All three of us knew and were inspired by Senator John McCain. Uh, it was my honor and joy to know him here at the Senate, to travel with him, and we hope to continue this conversation today um, in his spirit of leadership. If I might, Angelina, would you say that the situation for refugees um, globally has changed for the better or the worse in the 20 years that you've been connected um, with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and have served as a special envoy? Sadly, it's, it's worse, it's much worse. If you just look at the numbers, we, we have doubled in the last decade um, and uh, are most likely going to double, if not, if not sadly much more than that, especially if we don't address the climate crisis um, in, the, in the decade to come. Um, it's not just that the numbers are growing, it's that just that it seems that our inability to address the root causes, our inability to, uh, you know, uh, to meet the needs of the people during displacement and work with them to then not just survive this displacement, but to use this on average 18 years of displacement and then return to their countries and help stabilize and rebuild their countries. So I think we're failing on in, in many ways. And we're, I don't think there's one crisis that's more than, or one appeal that's more than 10% funded. We have situations that are 2% funded and, uh, what that really means in the field is people who are not going to survive. And so it's, uh, it's not sustainable. And it's, uh, it's a very, very, uh, it's, it's an explosive situation that if we don't get a handle on it is only going to grow and, and become much worse. So you wrote uh, an editorial with Senator McCain on the circumstances of the Rohingya, the um, genocide, the um, very um, horrific actions against the Rohingya. Um, that ran in the New York Times in 2018. It was one of the last editorials that our friend Senator McCain um, published. Um, how do you view the ongoing crisis um, regarding the Ohinga three years later? Um, and if he were still with us today, which of the crises around the world, and they are many, uh, and they are worsening um, that you referenced, which of the current crises do you think uh, our friend and Senator uh, would be um, charging into tackling today? Oh, I imagine he'd be on fire with many. <laughs> I think, you know, above all, from what I, I felt from him was he felt this responsibility of what is American leadership internationally and, and where do we stand? What is the principle, you know, that we will stand on? What lines will we not cross and what will we fight for? And, and, I, and I felt that strongly in working with him in 2018 about the Rohingya crisis and the genocide and talking about what had to be done what, who had to be held accountable, how seriously it must be taken to, to, um, you know, to address the, what had happened to these people, what had been happening for very long times. So I met Rohingya uh, families in India decades ago. This is not a new, new situation. Um, and I sadly, I, I reread what we had worked on together before, before this and you know, you, you read this and you see we, we, were, we were kind of begging for there to be a response. It is almost impossible not to connect the, the spillover of inaction um, and those and people being held accountable for horrible, horrible crimes um, isn't part of, if, if not in large part, why it is as bad as it is today. And we see that repeatedly. We are, when we are, when we do not respond, when there is a lack of accountability, when we let lines be crossed and we don't step forward, we are sending a message that we don't take it seriously, we won't stand against it, we're empowering abusers. So I think he would be angry. My, uh, my first trip with Senator McCain involved stopping in Afghanistan among several other countries. 
Um, all of the countries we went to had some refugee crisis or issue of some kind. Um, our last visit was to Jordan to visit a refugee camp of Syrians. Uh, our first visit on that trip was to Afghanistan. Um, you've had a particular heart for these countries. Um, tell me how you see the situation that's evolving in both Syria and Afghanistan. Oh, well, I'll speak. I'll speak on Afghanistan because it's fresh in my mind. I I was on the two weeks before 9-11, I was on the border of, of uh, Afghanistan in uh, Quetta, Pakistan. And I was there because I looked at, a, at these maps with my UN work and I said, where are, the, where are the most displaced people in the world and why? And without knowing much and without being a senator, or a, you know, I, I landed myself there because that's where the displacement was. And, and the, at the time there had been decades after the, you know, the, the, one conflict in Afghanistan and there'd been seven years of Taliban. And, and at the time they were closing camps, they were pushing people back from Pakistan into Afghanistan while the Taliban was still being as brutal as, as they were being. The, the point is I have watched, I have watched that moment. I have watched 9-11. I've watched the, the people forcefully returned to, to nothing. I have followed people back into Afghanistan and seen them. Um, I've seen so many promises made and broken. I have met with troops, American troops, who've given their limbs and lives um, to, to believe in the cause of helping the Afghan people, most of all the women and girls. And I think we are in a moment where we are in grave danger of abandoning those promises. That's not to say about pulling out or, or not, or whether there should be troops. It's about our continued commitment to what we went in there for and what we rallied our nation behind, which was the defense of these innocent women and children. And if we are simply going to walk away, um, we are going to be seeing another crisis and another refugee crisis, uh, another humanitarian crisis. So we have to, because um, we already see a lack of, of protection for these women. We're already seeing executions of, fe of female, um, uh, for, for, of women who are standing up for their rights and, and uh, leaders in the country, executions. So um, we have to be very, very careful in this moment so we don't, uh, we don't repeat the sins of the past, which we, we well, often have in the country. I have no doubt that if uh, John were here, that he would be a forceful voice um, for us to ensure the safety of those who um, served alongside us as interpreters, those who worked with us in terms of security, and in particular, uh, women who stood up and fought for their role and their rights in uh, the society in Afghanistan. Um, Hamdi, if I might um, bring you into this conversation, um, you also, uh, just as Angelina was in uh, Pakistan right before 9-11, you were in uh, Colombia just before the pandemic hit, and you witnessed firsthand the massive influx of Venezuelan refugees uh, into Colombia. Can you tell us more about what you saw uh, and how that made you feel? Sure. It's... You know, Senator Kuhn, it's great to be with you and Angelina. Uh, before, before I start um, on Colombia, um, my journey uh, getting involved with the topic of refugees, this, this the biggest humanitarian crisis, uh, is, has been recent, like 2016, 2015. Um, all along, um, you know, this, this issue has been around for a long, long time. But what Angelina has done, being uh, um, attention to this topic, using her voice, using her presence as a consumer, uh, it has a tremendous effect on me and a tremendous effect on a lot of people. So I want to thank her because the first time I see her and I want to thank her for the work that she's been doing. Uh, it's, it's the most meaningful work. Uh, of course, when you see a border, when you, when you go see the people, it's impossible not to get affected. But then when you look at the resources that we have, when you look at you know tools that we have, and you look at the places that we live, and you say, this is, these, are the, these are the problems can be solved. But most importantly, these issues can be prevented before it happens. You know, it, it's totally preventable if only international community can come together and say, we're not going to allow this crisis to arise and be catastrophic for people, for citizens, and especially for children and women. And we can solve this by getting together and, 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 and finding solutions. It's true for Venezuela, it's true for Syria, it's true for Afghanistan, it's true for all the crises we look for. Now, one thing generated now by these tensions, fights, terrors, you know, wars, but what should we 
we should be prepared for is there will be uh, refugees uh, going forward because of climate uh, crisis that we're facing, because of um, a drought that we will be facing. So we will be facing this crisis no matter what. Some of it, we can be prevented it. Some of it, we just have to respond to it the most humane way. Uh, coming back to Colombia, similar to what I saw in Turkey, similar to what I saw in last post in Greece or, or Jordan or Lebanon, it is people moving, uh, running away from, um, from danger, trying to find a safety for themselves and their families and trying to make a new life. Um, and it's, 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 it's clear everywhere. Um, when I went to Colombia, I knew of Colombia, I knew of Colombian people, but I was really blown away uh, from the President Duke to the business community and the, the leaders and municipalities and ordinary people as a citizen coming up and saying that these are my, our brothers and sisters, we have to step up. Now, if you live in a, a country like Colombia where unemployment is very high and uh, public resources are very limited, uh, and then you are going through the challenges like they, are, they have been in the internal war, you would think that people will react differently. But yet, we, again and again, we see uh, countries with very little resources stepping up. Uh, you, you see that in Turkey, you see that in Jordan, you see that in, in, in a lot of places. My goal was uh, bring the business community along. So within a few days, we were there. Uh, we got together as CEOs, um, you know, uh, 20, 20, 30 of us, maybe more. Uh, we shared our experiences. I shared my experiences. And I, we talked about the importance of business stepping up. Uh, not leaving this topic only for the government and NGOs. Uh, and I share experience. You're wearing a ball cap um, that has the word um, tent on it. Um, my understanding is you've launched a nonprofit, the Tent Partnership for Refugees, that uh, focuses on mobilizing um, private sector resources to help refugees um, settle into new communities. Can you just tell us a little bit more, Hamdi, about your work engaging the private sector? Uh, in welcoming and supporting refugees in their struggles. Sure, and my whole journey started is in upstate New York when I bring back this old factory that was closed. So when I hired everybody back uh, that used to work in that factory, I, I widened my geography of hiring and hit this town called Utica, and where I used to live, beautiful small town, and they said that a lot of refugees are being settled here but they're having a hard time finding jobs. And simple as it might be, and when I did, and I found out the reason that they were having a hard time finding jobs is either language or transportation or training. And, and it really hits the HR department. So I basically said, okay, well, we'll get some cars, we'll get some translators, and we'll do the training at the work. Uh, in a few years, in this very rural community in upstate New York, where the only immigrants they had seen before was Frank, who's from Sicily, who has a pizza shop in that town, and I was the second one. So they had never seen people from, you know, uh, Nepal or Syria or, or, or South America. What I saw in a few years, Senator is, you know, people from 19 different languages, uh, 19 different countries, 16 different languages. Uh, we get together and became family, and shoulder to shoulder, uh, we make yogurt and we build life. Uh, and when I saw that, I realized that you don't stop being refugee when, I, when you move to a safety place. You don't stop being refugees when you come to the US or to Europe or any other place. You stop being refugee the minute you get the job. And that's the minute you stand on your feet. That's the minute you contribute to the family. That's the minute you start to part of society. And then I watch how their children went to these schools, how they become members of society and community, how they contributed to my company, Chobani, and to everyone around it. And I thought not only is the obligation of business to get involved, but it's really good for business to get involved because I just saw what kind of energy and engine I got my own business. So I started Tent, I went to Geneva and a couple of other places, and we started with four companies, uh, UPS, Airbnb, uh, MasterCard and Johnson Johnson. Uh, today we have about 140 multinational large companies all around the world uh, committed to hire refugees, train refugees. Um, during the pandemic, uh, you know, we did uh, 
in announcement companies uh, supporting LGBT communities, women in Europe, uh, and in Colombia, we created this coalition of 20, 25 companies coming up, making commitment of hiring refugees from Venezuela. And that, I like to believe that the business community affected President's decision. I'm going to allow our brothers and sisters from Venezuela to legally to work, have an access to public, um, of, uh, you know, public, uh, you know, schools and hospitals, uh, that kind of services, and that to me is the most beautiful news. Um, nothing so good about this whole thing, but seeing a leadership rising and answering, uh, and businesses stepping up. Uh, is the beginning of solving probably this issue uh, in Colombia and globally. So as TENT, we try to create coalition wherever we go, and we try to work with policymakers to make it easier for companies to hire and, and train refugees. And hopefully with this effort, because businesses and brands have some powerful, powerful voices, can impact the, the, the brand refugee in society and think, think refugees what they deserve to be taught with, which is, you know, this amazing human spirit, this um, this fight for 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 better days, this this um, trouble that they've gone through, but yet looking for you know better opportunities for their children and for their families. Uh, and if anything, we should celebrate this spirit, not to push push away from from our, our communities and societies. So holy. Uh, with these efforts, we have this, this perception of refugees, which is, I think, Angela and I, we totally agree that is important. How these are brothers and sisters, people like, just like you and I, um, did not want to move, did not want to go anywhere. Uh, they're forced to and now looking for a new life. If anything, with our arms and our homes and our communities, that tend to be part of it. And not only be part of it, move us forward and make us better. Uh, in every front, which a lot of studies show that it is the case. So that's the work I do. Uh, hopefully, you know, continue to do so. Let me ask two more questions, if I might, um, of both of you. Um, Hamdi, um, Angelina, you've both mentioned climate change and the ways in which uh, the coming climate chaos is going to further exacerbate the already um, out of control challenges we have uh, with internally displaced peoples, with international refugees around the world. Um, how do you see climate having an impact on refugees? Um, and how do you see your role as a leader among CEOs, a leader among celebrities in using your voice and your responsibility to help us focus on climate and the ways in which climate change will exacerbate refugees as a challenge for our world? Well, I think one of there's a lot of discussions of climate change and what, what will it be? When will we see that we already know certain things are, are being damaged, right? We can see this melting or this happening. One of the, one of the most devastating uh, examples of how climate change is already wreaking havoc, affecting and changing our world and, and um, leading to a world in a way we have never, never ever seen this, this kind of, uh, you know, the, the human suffering and, and the, the lack of resources, the pain, um, is that th there are more people displaced from climate than almost anything else. Because even when you think of a, you think of Darfur, Darfur is, a, is, is lack of water. There are so many conflicts where it is, it is the fight over the resources. It is the desperation grown from the desert expanding, from the lack of water, from the natural habitat of the, the, the tribal peoples being completely erased. That is why many of these conflicts are, are happening. It's why there is no sudden easy return home or solution when there's a kind of agreement signed. You, you can't, there are islands that are sinking. There are places where people live that no longer will exist. And there need to be new laws to protect those peoples, to, to, to understand that that's a different kind of, of refugee crisis. And it is, and we are already seeing it. It is what you're seeing. It's why the numbers are growing so rapidly. You know, that and, and you know, our lack of, of diplomatic solutions and political solutions to, to conflicts. But climate change is already, is already displacing people. So 
I think to really sit with that and understand that these numbers are going to be multiplying quickly um, and how that's going to affect every country and how that's going to affect the entire world and uh, you know, all of our relationships and our foreign policies um, is to just take a very different look, look at this reality um, and, uh, and, and have to find different solutions. You know. Hamdi, how do you see climate change uh, interacting with uh, our need for policies and uh, approaches that'll deal with this steady increase in the number of displaced persons around the world? Um, I totally agree with Angelina. It's already here. Um, in, uh, underlying um, you know, reason of a lot of conflicts is really limited resources, uh, already, co already creating conflict. And what Hamdi told us, uh, Senator Kuhn, is there are global challenges that we're facing that is not, cannot be, cannot be, none of us are immune from it. None of us can be run away from it. Uh, and, and why this is one of them, and this global, um, you know, um, uh, warming is, 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 is challenged for all of us, even wherever we are in this country, Europe, or wherever we are. And in some areas, intensity is a lot higher because the resources are a lot lower. So anything that we can do as an international community come together and the business community commit and the consumer community, commit, uh, community watch and, and keep us in order. This is, I don't think we have a minute to waste. I don't think we have an hour to waste uh, when it comes to this massive challenge. Everything else, uh, you know, social issues, uh, income inequality, uh, you know, refugee crisis that we're facing, you will see that every single one of them is, is leading into this, um, um, uh, this, this major crisis. Um, I really do believe that if you are thinking of our children, you know, wherever they are, and leave them a world uh, that is is as at least is better than what we found, mm -hmm. it's not worse than you know found, is we must be together. And and I I know there's a lot of value on what business community do, consumers' power is, but I cannot emphasize enough on policymaking to make this to come. And, and meet an above and beyond politics and come up with solutions because those policies really is gonna help. And international community is massively needed. Uh, you know, we see it in our work when it comes to this humanitarian process, when it comes to refugees. So uh, I am really encouraged on, on the consumer and the people front, especially the among youngs. I'm really encouraged on this ESG topics becoming a you know, really top topic on the business community when it comes to investments. Um, but we are just in the beginning of this and we have no time to, do, to waste. Well, this has been a great conversation. I really have enjoyed hearing from both of you. Um, let me ask you a closing question, if I might. For those who are joining this McCain Institute Sedona Forum virtually, um, what's your call to action? What would you have them take away from this conversation uh, about the current refugee crisis and about what we can and should be doing together. Hamdi, I'll ask you to start. Well, I'm, I'm going to say what I know the best. And I tell all my CEO colleagues and the business community, I say, hire refugees. You will never regret them. You will never regret that, I, that, 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 that move. And TANT is here to help is any form of shape that you need to, uh, to give you information on how. But what I can tell is the minute you get involved with this humanitarian topic, the rewards you get, not only as a responsibility that you must do, but what it brings to your business is something that you cannot put price tag on. Um, and that's what I tell all, all my you know, CEO friends and, and business community. And I, I'm, I'm blown away with the response that you're getting. The second part I will say is even if we can't hire because we have distance from the community of refugees, we can encourage our supply chains to, to look into this. Uh, and we can help the uh, humanitarian organizations to reach out to children and women, wherever they are in the camps and cities, and, and tell them that as a humanity, we are next to you. And that work is extremely impactful and extremely powerful. And, and I, I find that work to be extremely effective business and culture and performance of the business. So that would be my ask. Uh, it is a work of love uh, and is embedded um, in this country's, you know, every corner is embedded in our families, embedded in our families. 
And this is a family of humanity. I believe that this app is connected to the, 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 the business. Community. Thank you, Hamdi. Angelina, how would you call to action the folks who are joining us virtually today? I would say that we have to look at where we're failing and we have to understand where, as somebody who's worked at the UN for 20 years and continues to work with the UN and believes in what we do in the field, um, we're failing. And a lot of this is to do with the Security Council members, one of which is us, the Americans. Um, we have to really take a good hard look at what we're allowing to happen. We, we cannot be selective about who we defend and whose abuses we ignore, whether it's in our interest, business interests or whatever excuse we give ourselves. We, we have to define what, who we are going to be. And the way Hamdi explains in the most beautiful way, the value of, of refugees, um, how can we not see that? How are we all still questioning whether or not people are truly equal, add true, true value, and those who survived wars, they're not only equal to us, they are beyond us. They have survived more than we can ever imagine and, and could ever shoulder. And they, uh, they deserve us to, to invest in them, work with them, truly want to see them thrive. And, and uh, we have to think about working from like the ground up within the UN or with them, supporting them locally, not, not top down and not controlling and be very careful about um, our, our behavior internationally and make sure we're, on the, we're, we're doing the right thing. And, and uh, we mean what we say when we say we believe in equality and we have to, we have to stand up. Thank you both. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, this is in many ways the worst time for refugees in our living experience. And I am confident that the United States, uh, a nation that in many ways in critical parts in its history has welcomed immigrants and particularly refugees. I'm confident that we are at our best uh, when we are at our most welcoming. And I look forward to working with both of you 